it, it frustrates me, frankly, when I hear that uh, women are only a small percentage, can't raise money, can't do all of these things. Don't allow other people to build your walls up for you, right? It's you, there is, there are a lot of different avenues for capital, for example. There are a ton of angel investors out there. In fact, 60% of our cap table, um, not necessarily by percentage, but in terms of participants are women. And so we've had a number of individual investors who have reached out to us who have said, I love Hint. Hint helps me every single day, enjoy water, get off of sweeteners, and they are advocates for the brand. And so know that it is possible to go and do things. Can you join a large company and go and become a CEO? Maybe, maybe not. You're listening to The Mission Makers Show, a podcast that inspires humans to get into the mindset of success. My name's Farah Nanji, and I'm the founder of a business in the motorsports industry that explores leadership lessons from things like Formula One. I'm also a DJ and music producer in the underground electronic scene and a public speaker on key topics like resilience, building high performance teams, overcoming learning difficulties and stimulating creativity. And to tie it all together, I love writing thought-provoking content as a journalist for these industries which are so unique in themselves. On this show, I'm sitting down with some of the most inspiring and driven people I've met around the world to talk about their processes, their failures, the lessons they've learned, and how they are truly making an impact for this world. Hello and welcome back to Season 3 of the Mission Makers podcast. For this week's episode, I'm joined by one of the most powerful CEOs in America. Her name is Cara Golden and she is the brains behind Hint Water, a fast-growing beverage company that's a favourite in some of the biggest boardrooms in Silicon Valley, with a recent valuation of $150 million. She's won countless awards from Fortune's Most Powerful Women Entrepreneurs, Forbes 40 Under 40 and Fast Company's Most Creative People in Business. We talk about her journey in growing Hint, entering the industry with zero experience of food and beverages, how she continually pushes herself outside of the comfort zone, and what her visions are for the future. Just before we begin, if you're interested in some really cool rewards like DJ lessons, the chance to ask our guests questions and exclusive merchandise, head over to www.patreon.com forward slash mission makers to check out how you can access these exclusive rewards. And thank you to all of you guys who've been writing in to us and subscribing to the show. It really makes a difference. So don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you love the content that we're making here at Mission Makers and help us take the show to the next level this season. Cara, welcome to Mission Makers. We're so delighted to have you on the show today. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. I believe, are you currently in San Francisco? Just outside of San Francisco in Marin County. So about 20 minutes over the Golden Gate Bridge. Oh, nice. It must be getting cold there now. <laughs> it, it is, but it's uh, it's a brisk fall uh, day. So it's, uh, it's quite nice. I, I live in an area that has lots of hiking and uh, lots of wildlife. So it's, it's, uh, it's fun kind of seeing many animals go into hibernation and, and uh, it's, it's very sweet in, in many ways. Beautiful. So your journey to get to where you are today has been absolutely incredible. Um, you started at Timing straight out of university and then you moved into sales at CNN and then AOL as the VP of shopping and e-commerce, uh, where you helped to grow the company to about a billion dollars in revenue. Um, so what inspired you to take a step back from an already established career and uh, and make the plunge into starting your own business? Yeah, I, I didn't know this when I was leaving tech, when I, I was at America Online and was running the direct-to-consumer and e-commerce partnerships, but I had started my family and I kept hearing uh, from so many people um, that you can't take a break, right? You can't go and have a family and have a career. It just doesn't work. And so I thought, okay, well, I still have my family here and I want to go and spend some time with them and I'll figure that stuff out, whether or not you can have it all or, and do both later on. And as I was taking that time, that's when I really started to think about things that I think many parents think about when they have children, which is what am I putting into 
my kids' bodies? What kind of diapers do I put on them? What kind of stroller do I buy? All of those things I was experiencing myself. And as I share with new parents uh, every everywhere, that I never felt so stupid as when I had uh, uh, my first kids, right? That I thought I was really smart in tech and then all of a sudden I had these children that I had to care for and I have to make all these decisions for them. But while this process was going on, I was really looking at my own world of not only, I didn't obviously have a stroller for myself, but I, but what I was putting into my body. And I felt like I was a little um, dishonest about, you know, telling my kids that they need to, you know, not have this and not have this. But then what was I actually, was I practicing what I was preaching? And again, not really consciously thinking, okay, this is how I'm going to figure out what I'm going to do next. This is what my next company is going to be. But it was when I started looking at ingredients and when I started looking at my diet soda, my diet Coke in particular, that I realized that the ingredients were possibly not getting me as healthy as I wanted to be. And so I, I did a little test one day, not even knowing whether or not it was going to work or not, but I swapped out my diet Coke for plain water. And when I did that, that's when I realized that I felt better. Things that I had been trying to solve for years, like my adult acne that had cropped up over the last few years. I didn't even have acne as a teenager, uh, suddenly went away. And I thought, okay, well, maybe water is better for me, but it's still really boring. I mean, why? I can't stick with this. This is crazy. But I thought if I can figure out a way to drink water, with all, without all the rest of the stuff that's in these sodas, then maybe I'll be okay. So I started slicing up fruit and throwing it in water, still not thinking that this was my next career, my, my next product that I'm going to start, uh, that I was starting not only a new company, but also an entirely new category. For me, I was solving a problem for myself. And when I had solved that problem for myself in the first three weeks, a little shy of three weeks, I lost over 20 pounds. I lost 24 pounds in two and a half weeks. And I thought, that's nuts, right? If I can do that, then I bet I could share this idea with a lot of other people and help people to get healthier. So people always say to me, you must have you must have been a fearless risk taker you go and start take on big soda and go and decide to start an entirely new product in an entirely new category i'm like it, it actually wasn't as complicated as that for me it really was this purpose and this mission that drove me that made me see that even if i failed even if i could only get a little bit of traction, I thought the fact that I just try is enough and we'll see what happens. And, and so that was the story of, of starting Kint. I, I call myself an accidental entrepreneur because I, I didn't actually put up this big goal, this big plan of, I'm going to go start a company. Like that's way too daunting for so many people to go to. Instead, I encourage people to think about if you're going to start a company, start with your purpose, start with your why, why, what's your mission? Why, why do you think this can actually work? And if you're doing something, if you have an idea that's actually going to help a lot of people globally, it, it doesn't matter how long it takes. It's the idea that you can actually get traction and just keep going along the way and helping people, which I fully believe Hint has done that really continues to lead you and drive you and gives you the type of energy, even during those times when things might be a little tougher. Yeah, I absolutely love that. I'm a huge advocate of adding essential oil into my water. And, you know, like even the line of work that I do, you know, when I was young, it was it was a passion and just so lucky to be able to turn that into work. But 
in a way, you know, you're much more motivated and driven by the sort of flaws that you experience as a consumer um, versus the, you know, sort of planning it out to the T and and sort of maybe not being so passionate about something because you, you don't identify with that pain point as much. Um, and so the meaning of your name, Kara, is care and beloved. Um, and I'm curious as if you've ever thought about how this might translate to your life or even your destiny. It's so interesting. I mean, Kara is uh, is a, uh, I, I remember hearing it for the first time. Uh, I was named after if anybody who followed the Kennedys. My parents were huge Kennedy John F. Kennedy fans, and there was a, a niece named Kara Kennedy. Uh, she passed away a few years ago, but I was named after her. Uh, my maiden name was Keenan, so I think my parents thought, okay, Kara uh, Kennedy, Kara Keenan. And um, I remember I had a friend when I was uh, when I was little, um, Angela Tassoni, and her father was from Sicily and they were first generation and um, came came over to the US from Italy. And he would always say, Cara mia, he was like face, you know, it's got all these different meanings in all in all these different countries. So I think for me, uh, it was it was kind of the recognition as a young kid that it means something good to many, many people in a lot of different countries. And Maybe that's the reason why I would ultimately want to do good, I guess, and that it it's it's got that kind of meaning that makes people smile and gives people hope in some way. Mm, definitely a sort of subconscious uh, vibe to what you then went on to to um, empower other people through. Um, what's what do you think is the greatest challenge with that? The, what, what was the greatest challenge you faced starting a company that sort of went against these huge giants in such a well-established industry? Great question. I, I think more than anything, I didn't know what I didn't know. And so it sounds great to come up with an idea that you can help a lot of people. You can go save the world, right, in some way. But when you start to realize that there are little hurdles along the way, there's, there are walls being built every single day to prevent you from moving forward. And often those walls are within yourself, right? They're only increased by others confirming what you already kind of, even if it's just a speck, believe that you can't. So that may be people sharing with me, you're a tech executive, you're not a beverage executive. Why do you think you can go and get traction? Why do you think that you could actually build a big company? You don't have the right experience. You don't have the right education. Uh, to be able to develop something like this. And, and again, it starts with you. It starts with you being able to be okay with not having all the answer, be okay with being humbled. I think often, I'm sure you've experienced this as well, when as you grow in any industry, I think that the challenge is, is that people have expectations about what you should be doing versus what maybe you want to be doing. And for me, I see so many people who have grown in the corporate ladder, women and men, who find themselves in this position where they're no longer learning anymore. They're, they're supposed to be mentoring, managing, doing what they do really, really well. For me, I had this craving that I wanted to go back down the ladder and I wanted to go start something new. It's very difficult to do that in your own industry right? Unless you go and pop over into another industry and you say, okay, I've proven myself in this other industry. Now let me go do this. So I think that the, the big answer uh, to, your, to your question is that while I didn't know what I didn't know, I also didn't know if I could because I listened in the early days. I thought that I had to hire people with lots of experience. I thought that I wasn't going to be able to get traction. But then when I kind of reset myself and reminded myself that I had figured out really hard things in my previous life, that I was capable of a lot more, uh, it, was, it was that voice inside my head that I had to reset on my own and I had to take responsibility for it. 
to know that I wasn't in a hurry. I could take my time to do this. And I was doing this as a choice that I didn't have to be doing what I was doing, but I did it because I wanted to, to do that. And frankly, that was, that was ended up to be a journal. And I started writing these things out. I didn't imagine that that would turn into a book. Right. So a lot of what my book is undaunted was actually about my own voice talking about these experiences along the way that I would run into. So many people have read it and have shared with me. I never thought about being an entrepreneur and being an entrepreneur, becoming an entrepreneur until I read your book, because I thought if she can do it, all the stuff that she learned, not only about an industry, but also about herself what I was capable of doing, that it's, it, it inspires you to live and, and live a full life that lets you know that you're capable of going out and doing much more than maybe you ever thought that you could. Definitely. And, and how long it, was it before you, when you started that, um, that journey before Hint started gaining traction and even getting into, um, into sort of companies like Google and, and, and other huge sort of um, other companies? Yeah, you know, it's funny. Traction for me is such a it's it's such an interesting um, question. I, I was just I was doing a keynote right before this and, and uh, somebody asked me that. And, you know, we've continued to grow every year. We've never had a down year and it's all been really exciting. I think part of what's been so exciting is that we've always looked for new holes in the market. And so for us, one of the big kind of holes that we saw and truly by accident was getting into, uh, we call it corporate food service. So the offices like Google and Facebook and some of the others, uh, I was actually uh, headhunted to, after I had started Hint, I, had, I was you know, carrying cases into the local supermarkets and a friend called me from Google and said, I don't know what you're doing right now. I know you took a few years off from America Online and you're staying at home with your children, but would you be interested in talking to me about a job? And I thought, oh, I can actually go have lunch with adults right now and not be working. Maybe I'll go and hear them out. See, it was probably one of those days that I had, you know, wondered whether or not I was going to be able to be successful at doing my company Hint. And it was during that moment, I had a bottle of Hint in, in my bag and I it was a friend that I knew in my previous experience who was working at Google, Omid Kordasani. And Omid said to me, he, he said, so what do you think? And I said, Omid, I have to be honest with you. I really appreciate you reaching out to me, but I've started this company. And he said, you're kidding. And I think he thought it was another tech company. And I said, no, it's this beverage company. And I pulled a bottle of cucumber hint out of my bag. He said, you started a beverage company? do tell, like, let me, this is so cool that you would take the risk and go and do this. And it was funny because that was the response that I was getting from so many tech executives that they thought it was a little crazy that I had gone and done this, but they were inspired by the fact that I thought I could. And I thought every time I would have one of these conversations, I thought there has to be something here that when I would talk about the purpose of trying to help people drink water without sugar or diet sweeteners in it, even if they weren't addicted to diet sweeteners like I was, they were intrigued by it and they saw the purpose early. And I thought, I just need to find the people that really need this product. And so the more I think that I would start to have those conversations, that was another thing that I that I saw really early on was that as I started to share these conversations, people wanted to be helpful to me, even if they weren't in my industry. And so the case of Google in particular, Amid said to me, you know, we have chefs that are cooking for us on Google campuses right now. Maybe we should actually order some of your water. I think he was kidding initially, but then he connected me with the person who was the head chef, Charlie, and Charlie said, sure, we'll try some of your water. If the people don't like it, we're not going to continue ordering it. And I said, sure, I get it. That's fine. And then suddenly 
they were ordering, you know, 300 pallets uh, every couple of weeks. And so they became huge customers because they wanted to help in, in some way. So that was a, a huge moment of traction, I guess. But the other thing that, uh, that I think is probably the most interesting about some of those points where we started to get traction was that it created this, this pull for us as uh, it, we became big inside of Google, then suddenly Facebook came on the map and then Facebook saw what Google had and then they would reach out to us and they'd say, we would like to carry your product as well. Or a local store would hear from a consumer who worked at Facebook or Google and they, they would bring a bottle of Hint into the store and they'd say, you should have this product as well. They'd become our, our, you know, sales force and our, um, you know, affiliate network, however you want to look at it to be able to help us drive those sales. So I think that there were so many points along the way that, that really helped us to get the traction and, and truly it was, it was by accident more than anything. So why, why the name Hint? What does that name mean to you and to the company? So the original name for, for the company was uh, Wawa. So as my husband said, I think you've been hanging out too long with your young kids when I originally came up with this idea for the product called Wawa. Uh, I don't know. Maybe that's how some people, including me, that tried to get my children to understand the word water. And uh, there's a large grocery or C store chain on the East coast of the U S called Wawa. And my husband being an attorney, um, said it's a really bad idea. You'll never get the trademark for Wawa. So we shouldn't even apply for it. And, uh, that's when I sat there and thought about names and I said, well, we're putting just a small hint in, into, uh, into the bottle. Uh, maybe we're giving people hints. And before I knew it, I had come upon this word that I thought was perfect. It was easy for people to remember. It was wonderful. And uh, my husband, again, the, the lawyer, uh, kind of killed the idea initially and said, it's a four letter word. You'll never get the trademark. He was not my favorite person at this moment. And I said, just apply for it. Stop being so negative about it, and uh, and so we did, and and we got the worldwide trademarks on on Hint. That's awesome. Um, talking about your your family and your your children. Um, so I know that you, when you were starting Hint, your kids were under the age of six. So, uh, what advice would you give you know to our listeners who are our fellow parents and our entrepreneurs or thinking of starting their own business about really sort of carving out that work life balance and and having that support. Yeah, I think we we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to be balanced. And I think if there's nothing else that I've learned, especially over the last few years, it's just stop thinking of yourself as always having to be balanced. There's going to be days when you're not so balanced because something comes into your um, circle that is disruptive in some way. And I think more than anything, what I focus on is is really being able to uh, manage those days that are, you know, not so fun, that are unexpected. But I think also as it relates to children, uh, one of the chapters that I share in the book is around my, my son, uh, Keenan, who is now 19 years old, but at the time he was 12 years old and he, he was watching Sheryl Sandberg on television talking about leaning in and um, balance. And, and uh, he said, Mom, I just realized that women don't run companies. They're not CEOs of companies, but you've always been a CEO. And I thought, okay, where are we going with this conversation? And, and he said, you know, I just never really realized it seems so normal to me. I, I don't really understand what the problem is. And that's when I, I realized that there was a huge uh, situation that had gone on over the years that I wasn't even aware of. I was teaching my children what normal should be, right? And that they were seeing that their mom had 
come up with an idea, had switched industries, had uh, had recruited her husband, who was the lawyer, into being a chief operating officer uh, for the company and helping me. Uh, so lots of things that maybe I guilted myself at, at some points along the way, wanted to be more balanced, wanted to be, you know, wondered if I should be spending more time with them. They were actually living in an environment that they, that they could later see as a learning environment. And now I think what my children would say, I have two in university, I have one in graduate school and uh, one still in high school is that they, are looking at their studies today as something that interests them today, but also they want to do something that they're really passionate about, that they're really curious about. And they also know that they can change. I mean, no longer do we think about university or we shouldn't think about university as whatever we do in university is what we're gonna be doing for the rest of our life. I mean, how many of your friends went to university for something or didn't go to university at all and are doing something totally different, right? It's, it's more than anything, find your curiosity, find your, um, find your difference, find your gift that you've been gifted to kind of think through and tackle in some way. So I would say that that would be the thing that uh, I think back on for myself, but also what I think my kids think about and are encouraged to think about uh, whenever possible. Hey you, we hope you're enjoying today's episode. We're on a serious mission here to create one of the world's best podcast series and we'd be so grateful if you could support us in any way by becoming a patron of the show. There's a tier to suit every level from early bird tiers where you get downloads to all my music with some super cool ninja stickers to our VIP Mission Maker tiers where you get epic rewards like exclusive footage that never gets aired, the chance to submit questions to our guests with signed copies of books from them, DJ lessons, one-to-one coaching, and a whole load of super cool Ninja and Mission Maker merchandise. You can start supporting us for less than what it costs you to fill up your car for a month by simply heading over to www.patreon.com forward slash mission makers. Thanks for listening and I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. Yeah, I think this whole uh, time in in recent uh, couple of years has really challenged the whole notion of education and what we, you know, spend our lives sort of pursuing and really the purpose and and mission and passion behind that. Um, Talking about gender and balance, you know, we're still here today, 2021, and only 8% of Fortune 500 company CEOs are women. So what do you believe, you know, can be done as a society or in sort of those executive positions to kind of just swing the balance and, and get get more or more females into leadership positions? I think entrepreneurship is the perfect opportunity for for women. I mean, how many women have have you come across over the years who have great ideas, right? They're very creative, but they just don't go and do those opportunities. They just don't try them. And so one of the things that I like to tackle uh, in, and tack, I tackle in my book as well, Undaunted, is that you actually can do things. When you think about, it, it frustrates me, frankly, when I hear that uh, women are only a small percentage, can't raise money, can't do all of these things. Don't allow other people to build your walls up for you right? It's you, there is, there are a lot of different avenues for capital. For example, there are a ton of angel investors out there. In fact, 60% of our cap table, um, not necessarily by percentage, but in terms of participants are women. And so we've had a number of individual investors who have reached out to us who have said, I love Hint. Hint helps me every single day. Enjoy water, get off of sweeteners and they are advocates for the brand and so know that it is possible to go and do things can you join a large company and go and become a ceo maybe maybe not if that's what you choose to do but why not go out and start something based on an idea that you have to actually solve a problem i think that when you do that you control the dialogue you control what your ability is to actually rise to the top or not. And I think that that's something that people need to be reminded about. 
Yeah, definitely. And your your story only really embodies that further. Um, talking about challenges, what do you believe at the moment are some of the, the hardest uh, things about the sort of uh, beverage and water industry? And also, what do you see as the opportunities at the moment? Well, I think that one of the things that's pretty unique, first of all, for those of you who have never heard of him, we're only in the U.S. today. We're the largest privately held non-alcoholic beverage in the U.S. that doesn't have a relationship wow. with Pepsi or Dr. Pepper Snapple. I would love to be uh, in the U.K. and and Europe and Asia. We've had many uh, people reaching out to us, particularly during um, the pandemic, in a time when uh, people are paying more and more attention to health. I mean, health and wellness. I think is one of the number one priorities today worldwide for people. And Hint is a product that does nothing but helps people really stay hydrated and, and really continue to stay healthy. I think that the opportunity more than anything in the beverage industry uh, is to help people in a way where you look at the thousands of other products that are out there, I don't think that they can actually say most of those that they're doing what products like Hint are to actually help people uh, get rid of their type two diabetes, control um, some diseases and, and issues that they have. And so I think that that's what the big opportunity is. And again, when you are working on a product, whether it's in the food and beverage industry or in some other industry where you're really focusing on helping a consumer in some way, that is really the, the, the mecca, right? Like that is where somebody can, can really get behind your brand. And, and I think the other piece of our product that a lot of people talk about in the US is almost 40% of our overall business is direct to consumer. And so that may seem like, well, you know, of course it is. Well, not so fast. I mean, the majority of beverage companies out there are really focused on getting into stores, getting into uh, grab and go cases within um, different uh, Starbucks or um, different uh, food chains across the US. And you look at what happened during the pandemic that it was really unpredictable when many of those places would be open or movie theaters or sports stadiums. So a lot of those uh, large soda companies were hit very, very hard and beverage companies were hit very, very hard. For us, because we already had a direct to consumer business in place, that business just continued to grow. And a lot of people have asked us like, well, just because you have this way of getting to the consumer, um, what happens to those sales? I mean, is it, does it cannibalize the existing sales? Does it, you know, what exactly, does it take the place of it in any way, especially during this time? No, I mean, what we saw was that people still would go to Costco, for example, and if we had a different pack size or we had a uh, variety pack where we typically are not promoting those online, they would still go in and buy those variety packs inside of a Costco. But I think it, it what we saw is that they, they feed off of each other and it's truly an omni-channel approach that I think is what we're, where we're headed. Whether you're a beverage company or a shoe company or an eyeglass company, I mean, that is the, the key to, uh, where we're at with retail today. It can happen anywhere as long as you are focusing on satisfying that consumer and where they want to be purchasing. Mm, definitely. Um, and so no pun intended, but we've hinted a little bit here towards your book, Undaunted. So talk to me about the journey around that and, and what inspired you to sort of, to open up and write that book. Yeah, well, I, as I had hinted about early on, I was writing in my journal for years and kind of thinking about a lot of these different issues and how, um, you know, more than anything, it was, uh, there were things that would come up that I was trying to tackle along the way that really were hard at times. And when I, I felt daunted, but I thought once I kind of regrouped, once I figured out a way to break through it never was as bad as I thought it was going to be. Or I also believed that when 
days look really dark, what you have to do is really look for the light, right? You have to look for those different opportunities. Uh, I'm sure you've had those days when you thought, oh, I lost a customer or I lost a partnership of some sort. When you sit there and really focus on the good and figuring out what did I learn um, from this challenging time? Did I put too much trust, too much faith in something? Did I have too many of my eggs in one basket, right? That I was too reliant on this. That's the opportunity, right? When we learn from our most challenging times. And so things like that, I would share these with my children, with my friends, with my colleagues, employees. And I thought, you know, that's really where we, that's the opportunity and that, that we need to all be aware of. And so I thought I should write these notes out. I should publish these notes that I've, I've written down over the years and see what would happen. And a friend of mine who's authored a few different books said, you mean write a book? And I thought, oh, I can't write a book. I mean, that's way too hard. I'm a CEO of a company. I, when would I have time to write it? And then when I looked at my notes of about 600 pages of a journal, that's when I thought, okay, well, maybe I can hire an editor to help me push these notes down into something. But more than anything, very similar to our product hint, I wanted to write a book that really helped people, that really helped people to see that it was going to be okay and that they needed sometimes to get out of their own way to go figure things out that they were smarter and much more capable than maybe they ever thought they were and the only way to actually figure it out was to go try and also to be able to laugh at things along the way i always felt that even if this didn't work out with starting a beverage that i could go back into tech and i would you know, be the life of the party telling people how I had failed. It's okay to fail, right? And I think it's, it, it's your ability to be humbled. It's your ability to own what has ha happened to you and why you did things is where you get the most appreciation. It doesn't mean that no one will ever take a risk on you again, just because you failed. I think it's your ability to actually share what you learned along the way is where you benefit the most from it. And I wanted to share so many of those learnings, uh, not only with entrepreneurs, but as I said before, with other people who don't take risks, because taking a risk, you could fail, right? You could, something bad could really happen to you. And what I've learned is it's typically not as bad as you could ever imagine. It's not as scary as, as uh, maybe those dreams that you had when you were a little kid about what was really going to happen. It, it never really is that bad, but can you pick yourself back up again is, is another theme and just lessons that I've learned that I think could help a lot of people as well. Definitely. I mean, 90% of it really is that journey, no matter what happens through that, it's the, it's looking back and experiencing that with people. And um, as you say, sort of sharing the learnings, is there anything that, you like to do as an activity or, or 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 so that really pushes you out of your comfort zone you know i think more than anything i i like to kind of scare myself a little bit into doing things that maybe seem really hard to people or seem sort of counter to what i'm comfortable doing and i i'm always encouraging people to kind of go into that um that zone right where maybe things are just a little bit tough for you that you can't imagine. I, one of the th things that I uh, talk about in the book, another chapter in the book is, is a personal um, kind of fear that I've had for years, which is a fear of heights. And so I talk about my journey to uh, this wonderful place called the Grand Canyon, where I went hiking uh, in and out of the Grand Canyon in a day. It took a lot of uh, energy just to even think about the idea of training for something as big as this. But more than anything, I kept thinking about the, the down part, like how my, how my body was going to react to that, how my mind was going to react to that. And what I found was that there were things that were totally different in the journey down that I experienced. I did what I could. I planned as best as I could to journey down. I was, um, I uh, 
start at four o'clock in the morning when it was still dark out so that I couldn't actually see the bottom of the canyon as we were going down. But lots of things happened along the way, uh, running into snakes and coyotes and almost was killed uh, by a goat that flew over my head. I never predicted any of those things. But when I was surfacing out of the uh, you know 12 hour experience, that's when I realized all that I had learned as an entrepreneur and all that I had been through and, and how my journey along the way made me stronger in business and in life. And that I knew that I wasn't going to uh, die in the canyon, that this wasn't going to be my last rodeo, right? This was going to be challenging and hard, but I had to figure out how to take those steps. And so that's what I like to share with people too, that oftentimes you're placed in these positions where you think, oh, that's much too scary. I can't do it. Instead, figure out what you can do because maybe that little glimpse is actually helping you if you say yes to it, prepare for something much bigger that you needed to. And it may not turn out the way that you really want it to turn out, or maybe you don't succeed, or maybe you fail along the way, but maybe you need to go through that room, that journey, that tunnel in order to be able to be stronger for that next, in order to have the proper learnings to get to the next step. And so I think that that is something that we all need to embrace, that just because something didn't turn out the way we wanted to, just because something um, you know, was a situation that we failed in more than anything, maybe that is what you needed in order to find success. Yeah, definitely. Sometimes, you know, you can get to you in your own head and then you don't take the plunge. And, you know, that obviously the situation we find ourselves in, you know, with the pandemic, something none of us could have predicted. And yet we're all faced to adapt to um, to switch and, and to really just, you know, figure out a way to thrive somehow if we can through this uh through this time um you talked earlier a little bit about you know pe- um the the potential ex- interest to expand into the uk or to europe so what's your kind of vision for the future of the company did it evolve through the pandemic or is it still pretty much um what you thought it was going to evolve into yeah i i think we would love to bring it outside the us i think more than anything we are looking um at opportunities to grow where we can help people. And and in the US alone, I don't know what the world statistics are today around type two diabetes, but you know, type two diabetes in the US is the fastest growing disease there is. And it's a, um, it really is at epidemic levels where 16 and a half years ago, when I started Hint, one and a half percent of the population in the US had type two diabetes or pre-diabetes. Today, 40 to 45% has type two diabetes or pre-diabetes. 16 years later, it's grown wow. that much. And we have a major shortage of insulin um, in the US. It's not clear if it's a shortage or if it's actually uh, people's inability to be able to afford insulin. So can you imagine, I mean, I think about this a lot. I knew a few friends who were type one diabetics, um, the difference being that they were born with type one diabetes versus acquiring it, which is what type two is. And the fact that people can't afford to have insulin. And so they're actually deciding that they're just not going to have insulin at all. I mean, it's a huge problem. And yet we're not looking at the cause. We're not looking at, I think most of the people today who have type two diabetes would say that they're not going out of their way to have 12 cupcakes or pieces of cake a day. What they're doing is they're not able for whatever reason to um, you know, really monitor their um, and deal with their insulin levels inside of their body. And so in, why aren't we looking at these diet sweeteners and kind of the effects that they're having on people's systems? If it is true that they're not actually having full-fledged sugar um, in, in overdose, I think that what else 
actually feeds into this addiction to sweet and the addiction to um, to people still wanting and still believing that it's okay to have these diet sweeteners. And today, I think that there's so many words that are out there globally that kind of trick consumers into believing that things are, you know, healthy, healthier than they are, healthy perception versus healthy reality, as I term it. But it's, um, you know, the word natural, for example. Um, yes, today the diet sweetener of the uh, of kind of the winner of diet sweeteners is stevia, and it's starts out as a natural leaf, but then it's processed. And so what is that process? What is that doing to actually, once it actually hits the human body, what happens? And today, here's a really interesting thing to noodle on, but today a Diet Coke today is 30 times sweeter than a Diet Coke when they were introduced in the in the early 1980s, 30 times. And so every year we, two years, introduce a new version of these diet sweeteners. Oftentimes the consumer doesn't even know, they just might like it better. And you know, it's, it's like an addiction to crack. I mean, we're sitting here feeding it to people and saying, here, have more, have more. And people are getting more and more addicted to it, yet they're not actually getting healthier. And wasn't that the goal? Wasn't that the whole purpose of people pushing people over into eating low fat and drinking diet and eating diet and watching calories? Is our society getting healthier or are they getting sicker? And I think we all need to be looking at that globally and really figuring out. So if I can actually help people by providing a product that really does help people to get healthier. That for me would be, um, would be the goal globally. Definitely. And, you know, and as you say, um, as you're talking about that, it makes me, you know, also question where are the regulators in all of this? You know, if we're looking at the cause and the, and the core and the root, you know, what, um, and I'm sure many millions of people have questioned it, but, you know, we, we as a consumer, we st we really have to to demand more from the people that regulate That's these smart. industries. Yeah, um, Cara, what kind of leader would you say that you are personally? What? I think very uh, empathetic, passionate. Um, I, I think any leader today um, who was leading through a pandemic uh, can probably. Uh, it can probably relate to the fact that uh, you have to be one-on-one -on -one with your team when when necessary. That it's, uh, I think everybody sort of threw the rule book away that people were all going through their own situations, whether they were, you know, dealing with family members who were ill or dealing with their own mental health issues or homeschooling homeschool children at where, you know, they had to sort of deal with maybe situations that they had never dealt with. And frankly, situations that I hadn't dealt with uh, as well. So I think often uh, not trying to focus on balance so much, but instead trying to make sure and, and comfort people to know that it's going to be okay when they needed to hear that. And they needed to hear that there, that the support was there. And, and I think also, uh, more than more than anything, I think that people would say that I'm uh, transparent and in, in that I've, uh, you know, there were days that were challenging for me. And I think that you have to be able to really be honest with people about what you're going through and not, um, not you know, trying to hide in some way when you've got challenges that arise. I definitely uh, agree. And, um, you know, there's, uh... It, we're human in the end, you know, and that's and that's it. We're all we're all we all come from the same cloth in the end. So we all have similar fears and and values, and hopefully care about our families. And um, but having that empathy at the core is uh, is definitely so important. Um, we're going into our audience Q and A. We've had two questions that we've selected from our audience. Um, so Patrick from Ireland asks: uh, Is there a skill that you have yet to master that you'd like to? 
A skill. Uh, I don't know if it's a skill as much as I wish I were more patient. I, I you know, I've been, I've been growing this company for 16 years. I think for me, what seems so obvious to me from my own experience, I wanted everything to be um, accepted. I want things, to, people to get it, right? And so I think for me, it's less about a skill, it's more about a, uh, um, a, a, a state, I guess, <laughs> in some ways that I think, and frankly, I think a lot of entrepreneurs have this uh, problem, right? This challenge in front of them that they want it tomorrow, right? It's very, very difficult to be patient. It's very hard to be, to have a vision for something and have to wait for the audience to catch up to where you're at. So. Uh, if that's you that I'm speaking to, um, know that I totally get it. And it's something that I, I still work on to this day. Well, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, Shelley from New York asks, um, is water your element? Is it my element? I, you know, that's a good question. I think it's definitely my element. Uh, I would also say that maybe I'm a little bit uh, fire as well, that I'll want to... Uh, I'm a Gemini, so I think I, I I have two sides of me, I guess, to some extent, but I want to, um, I, I'm okay with igniting things and getting people to think about things, but I'm also um, interested in, in making sure that it flows properly and is done the right way. Wow, I love the way that you said that, it's very nice. Um, we're moving into the final part of our interview, which is a quick uh, fire round. So just 60 seconds on each question. Um, and we'll start with the first, which is what's your favorite place in the world to catch sunset? The Maldives. Nice. Um, what's currently at the top of your bucket list? Uh, getting out and hugging people. <laughs> <laughs> If you could trade lives with anyone for a day, um, who would it be and why? I'd say Ruth Bader Ginsburg because it's uh, it's uh, she was former Supreme Court justice in, in the US. I think more than anything, when I think about all the challenging times and how she went against the grain, uh, it's so easy to know that she was doing the right thing uh, by looking back, but I bet there were days when she wasn't sure yeah she had an incredible journey um what artist or band got you through the pandemic if any gosh so many um i would say you know i've been listening to a lot of oldies lately but um actually i just found on on audible there's a lot of uh really great um james taylor actually i just listened to something on um have you listened to the it's kind of behind the music have you listened to some of those on um uh, alanis morissette mm. and uh and i mean there's a number of them on there uh sting has one as well that sort of talks about kind of the behind the music. So I think more than anything, maybe that's not a traditional way to answer it, but I feel like it's uh, it's really, I stumbled upon them on Audible uh, and it's uh, it's a lot of fun to listen to those. Nice. Um, in the same, similar vein, uh, what is your favorite place in the world to, uh, or favorite bar in the world to experience jazz if you're a jazz lover? Jazz, oh, that's a good question. Um, Gosh, I wish I, th there are a couple of places actually in San Francisco um, that are, that now I'm drawing a blank on the names of it, but, um, but there's a few places in San Francisco that are pretty great for jazz and, um, and now I'm just drawing a blank on, on them, but I would say San Francisco. Okay, fine. You'll have to let us know after and we'll put it in the I show will, notes. definitely. Talking about San Francisco, um, favorite place to hike in San Francisco? Oh, Marin Headlands for sure. Uh, Tennessee Valley um, is a is a trail. There's so many the the Marin Headlands, the Dipsy Trail. Um, they all kind of sort of lead into the same place, but it's uh, it's beautiful and and it uh, 
has a little bit of elevation, but then drops uh, into amazing views that uh, that you're you're really on the the edge of the Pacific Ocean. And it's uh, on one side, looking out to the left, you look at the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, and on the right side. Um, you know, if you look way, way in the distance, maybe you'll see some Farallon Islands and some other things, um, but just knowing that there's a whole, whole world out there um, that that is just beyond the Pacific. Wow. Um, and finally, the, the, the last question we love to ask all of our guests is, uh, what are you most grateful for this month? And I know the month only just begun, so we can uh, reference it to the previous month, if you if you will. Yeah, family and friends and, and uh, you know, I think everyone has had their challenges, I think, over the last year and a half. But I think everybody should look back at this time as um, it, it was challenging and you made it, right? And I think people should realize that you've endured probably more than you ever thought you would be able to ha handle. And I talked earlier about that where you'll have times when you know maybe you have an opportunity to know that you have to go face something this was an opportunity for people that you didn't have a choice right but you went and did it anyway and take stock in the fact that you got through something incredibly challenging and what were the learnings that you learned about society life uh, about you and and what you cared about and and what you were capable of definitely that's a beautiful place to to end our our time with you Cara thank you so much for uh, sharing all of your insights and your wisdom with our audience it's been a, a real pleasure to chat with you and um yeah wishing you all the best and and thank you as well for sending over the um the uh, the case of hint I'm, I think I'm one of the few people in Europe or the UK to have them so thank you very much um and yeah all the best Thank you so much. If you want to grab a copy of today's show notes, then head over to missionmakers.com forward slash Cara Golden, where you'll also find notes from all of our previous episodes. We've got some amazing guests coming on the show this season, so be sure to share the show with your friends and subscribe to us on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and wherever else you listen to your podcasts. You can reach out to me at Mission Makers or at dj.n1nja on Instagram. And if you're interested in supporting the show and getting some super cool rewards like DJ lessons and exclusive merchandise, don't forget to visit patreon.com forward slash mission makers. Thank you for listening. And until next time, keep it laser focused. Mm -hmm.